Hello, Derek here from Lychee Slicer, and in today's video, I'm gonna cover, well, part three of the terminology videos. If you haven't seen part one or part two, that's all right, you can watch them out of order. However, if you are new to resin 3D printing, I do recommend watching all three. Well, this one is going to cover all the terminology around the software with resin 3D printing, specifically the slicer. And that's our first piece of terminology, what is the slicer? Have you ever seen those models where it's just a bunch of papers stacked up on top of each other that have been kind of cut, and when you put them all together, it makes like a face or a bust or something pretty cool? Well, essentially that's what a slicer does, but instead of a bunch of paper, it does it to a 3D model. In this case, mostly a .stl model. And that's why it's called a slicer. Essentially, it just takes this model, slices it up in a whole bunch of little pictures, and then those pictures go together in the second piece of terminology we call the PNG stack. And so what that basically is, is if you can imagine, if you take you know, a cross section of something and you look at it, you're gonna have the place where the cross section was and wasn't. And that's the reason why it's a PNG, because PNGs can have transparent pixels, where in this case, the white is what's gonna be printed, and then the black is what will not be printed, it's the, the dead space where your model isn't going to be. However, you can have more than just on or off, or white and black, you can have gray values. And those gray values are the next one, what we call anti-aliasing. Now, anti-aliasing in resin 3D printing is not quite like anti-aliasing in your video games. It's, what it's doing, it's going to change how much the resin is cured by using gray values. And the basically, the, if it's full white, then it's you know full power, full steam, you know, warp 11 or whatever. And if it's completely blacked out, then there's no power at all. So there's something interesting about anti-aliasing that you probably need to be aware of. And that is the new 16K LCDs on, doesn't matter which printer it's on, cannot do anti-aliasing at this time. If we're talking about an Elegoo printer that's non-16K, they can do up to 8-bit um, gray values, which is 256 different colors. I mean, in this case, it's colors like shades of gray. I'm trying not to use that term, but um, it's basically it's a lot. And so with that one, you can get a lot of anti-aliasing. In fact, so much so that if you're using the .goo format, you're not going to want to use anti-aliasing because it's actually so much data. There's a translation layer on the printer. And if you don't know, .goo is Elgoo's own format. And there's a translation to convert .goo back into .ctb, which the printer motherboard can actually read. And there's so much compute power there that it's so much data that it actually will probably cause the LCD to glitch. There's been an update out where Elgu will kind of turn it off, but if you don't have that update or yours is not working properly, the chance to have the motherboard kind of crash during the print and destroy your print is pretty high. So if you're using .goo, don't use anti-aliasing, only if you're using .ctb. But if you are using .ctb, 256 different shades of gray is a lot, and you can have really good anti-aliasing. However, if you have an AnyCubic printer, they only do 4-bit anti-aliasing, which gives you a total of 16 different shades of gray, which is not, as, not very many. However, it's pretty much enough to get some really good results. I've done a lot of A-B testing between Elegoo and AnyCubic, and I found the results on Elegoo to be ultimately slightly better, but not as much as you would think given how much of a difference there is between the different shades. However, that's enough about anti-aliasing. Let's move on to the next topic. And because for me, if I'm using visual aids to either teach or learn, I do find it easier. I'm gonna head over to Lightsy Slicer where I'm gonna use that as my visual aid for most of the rest of this video. However, a lot of these terminologies are, they're similar. So if you don't exclusively use Lightsy Slicer or you've never used it before, don't worry. A lot of this terminology is gonna be the same regardless. What I'm gonna do to get that visual aid is I'm gonna head over to the Lightsy Library and I'm gonna see this uh, Xenoborg, which is like a, a cyborg version of aliens. And I'm going to just click on that one, click on import the default model. And now that I've brought in that model by Danny's Wang, if I look over here in the slicer, what you're gonna see is that I've got the model in blue and then all these orange sticks all over. Well, those orange sticks are the supports, so this model would be pre-supported. However, there's two different kinds. This kind right here is what I would call a dynamically supported. And I say that because you can come in here and you can delete these files or you can delete these supports. I can interact with them, I can move them, I can delete them, I can add more. Basically, anything that's here that's done, I can undo or manipulate. But there's another type, and that's what I would call a baked-in pre-support. Also, just known, in, known as a pre-supported .stl. If I come over here and I turn on the second build plate, and I scroll over here, what we're going to see is this one right here. Everything is blue. I can no longer alter these supports. I can't click on them at all. I can't select them. They're kind of just a part of the model, hence baked in. Another way to kind of consider these ones right here, the ones that are more dynamic, is the file format in which they're saved, which is, I guess, the new parts of terminology, but these ones are specific to Lightsy Slicer. And this is gonna be a .lyt or .lys. If it's .lys, what that's gonna do, it's gonna be a single file that contains both the 3D files and all the supports. It's gonna look just like this, this alien right here when you load it in. If it's a .lys, it's gonna contain all the pre-supports already done, but it's not gonna contain the 3D files. You'll have to carry those in in a folder next to it so that you can load those into the scene, and then the supports that are already done will be loaded to the model. 
But that's the difference between the different types of pre-supports, the baked in pre-supports or the .stl or the .lys or .lyt when it comes to Lychee Slicer. The next piece of terminology you're gonna run into all the time regardless of what type of 3D printing you're doing is orientation. What we mean by that one is the rotation of the object. For that one, let's just look at this chest right here. And if I are on my keyboard, that's gonna pull up the rotation menu. And basically I can just rotate this around. So what we mean by orientation is just that you did a good job at orientating it to be good for resin 3D printing in this particular format. But if you're doing like FDM or anything like that one, they're also gonna talk about orientation to make sure that whatever you're printing in whatever format you're using, it's orientated or rotated in the correct position for that model for that type of 3D printing. The next one is islands. And when I say islands, I don't mean treasure island or something else like that one. I'm talking about islands when it comes to 3D printing. So for that one, let's look over this. I'm just gonna move this slider up and you'll see this little tip up here. This is what we see, what we call an island. If you look at it from the bottom, it just looks like this thing appearing out of nowhere, kind of like an island. If I look at it from the side, you'll see it's actually just an inverted cone. But islands can be much more complicated than that one. If we take a look at this chicken that's been turned around and I move my slider down, you'll see that there's lots of islands on this guy. Each one of those, toes, its head, everything. That's what we call an island. And the next one is overhangs. What are overhangs when it comes to 3D printing? Well, here I've got these three rectangles. This one is at 90 degrees, and if we look at the bottom of it, that thin sliver right there is the overhang, very, very small. This one that's more at 45. This one, there's quite a bit of overhang, but it's a little bit less. And this one at 90 degrees is a very big overhang, but basically a complete parallel to the build plate type of overhang. The one that's, par that's parallel is gonna never print well, require tons and tons of supports. But if you have an overhang like that one, you pretty much just have to support that whole thing like crazy, man. We start getting less of an overhang, less of an angle, closer to that 45 it gets much, much easier. But of course, as, as we get to that 90 and the overhang is very, very small, it becomes really easy to support. But anyway, this is overhangs when it comes to 3D printing. The next one is layer height. What do we mean when we say layer height in resin 3D printing? Well, if we go back to that stack of pictures I talked about earlier, let's say we've got a stack of pictures about yay tall. And let's say that stack of pictures has only four different slices in it. Well, it's not gonna create a very good looking shape. It's gonna be pretty blocky. But if that stack, let's say, has 10,000 pieces of papers in it, it's gonna be very high definition. And that's essentially what we mean by layer height. It's how thick is each layer in order to create the entire height of your resin 3D print. The way to change that is if you head over to export and you click on your resin profile under resin right here, and then you click on edit of your profile, right here it's gonna say layer thickness or layer height, it's the same thing. Most of the time we use just UM for short, but if you change it from that to millimeters, you're gonna see that the most common one is 0.05 or 0.03, probably the two most common. And of course, in between, I see some people use more or above or below, I see people use more, but those are the most common ones. And that's what we call layer height or layer thickness. Now, the next one we're gonna talk about is the UV exposure time. That is, it's kind of self-explanatory. What that is, is how long the UV light is going to expose the resin. And you'll see in lychee, it's actually broken down in two sections. You've got the burn-in layers, or sometimes known as bottom layers. And for this one, it's generally higher. What that is, it's actually going to expose the raft more. What the raft is, you see these models right here. This part that's at the very bottom, this is the part that makes contact with the build plate. It's gonna need more exposure time to really kind of make it stick to the build plate pretty well. As you move up past the raft, and you start getting into the supports and then the model itself, you need less and less UV exposure time. And that's when we get into the normal layers. And right here, you'll find that under exposure time as well. And that's generally much lower than the burn-in layers. And anyway, that's where you'll find, and that's what it means by the UV exposure time or just exposure time. But don't worry, I'm gonna talk about more about what these things are in a second. But while we're here in the UV settings, I wanna talk about what is TSMC. And when I'm talking about TSMC, I'm not talking about a computer chip manufacturer. I'm talking about two-stage motion control. The word two in there being the most important. What we'll find that setting is also here in Lychee Slicer. Now, not every printer has this option or looks like this in the slicer. It's based upon the type of printer. This particular one is, this is the GK3, which allows me to do something and that is enable or disable TSMC or two-stage motion control. And that's this on off button right here. I can just toggle that on or off and you'll see some of the settings go away or disappear. Underneath here, there's also light off delay. Just while I'm here, you can't have both of these on at the same time. It creates a bug in the Chichu Systems motherboard of the printer. So you can have either, you can have one or another one off or on. And the way you'll wanna do it is have TSMC on and light off delay off, allowing you to use what's called wait before print. And I'll talk about that here in a second. So what does two stage motion control or TSMC even do? Well, basically it allows us to run the print at two different speeds, which is very, very nice. The reason for that being is if my hand was the LCD, if this thing is close to the LCD or close to my hand, I want it to be running slow. 
If it's further away, I can allow it to run fast to save some print time. We want it to run slow when this thing is close to the LCD for many, many reasons. A little bit out of scope for this video, but just know that TSMC allows us to do that. Where it's up here, it can move really, really fast. And when it's down here, it can move very, very slow, giving us uh, basically a good balance between print time and high accuracy and low failure rate. But anyway, that's what TSMC means. And you'll find the settings here in Lychee Slicer. And just because I talked about it a little bit before, this little toggle for light off delay that I can turn on or off. If I turn it off, you'll see I have this setting wait before print, wait after print, or wait after lift. The one we care about is the wait before print. Also, sometimes you'll see it listed as wait after retract. Those mean the exact same thing as light off delay. Well, what is light off delay? Well, let's pretend this is my bill plate and it's coming down on my hand, which is the LCD again. It's basically going to come down and it's going to wait. For this one, I have it set to four seconds, so it'll come down and we'll count to one, two, three, four. Then the UV light would turn on cure it, and then you know it would peel off when after the UV light is done curing the resin for that layer. The reason why we love light off delay is because that's how we maintain accuracy on X, Y, and most importantly, Z. And that Z accuracy especially helps really well with failure rates and well, overall accuracy. But anyway, there you go. That's what light off delay, or in some cases, wait before print. That's where you find it, and that is what it means. So now let's talk about supports and specifically this model right here. The green part we've already talked about, that's the raft. A part of the supports, but not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about these things right here. And you're gonna notice there's a couple colors. There's white, yellow, blue, and orange. The yellow right here is what we call the support shaft. This is the thing that's basically gonna run as much vertical as we can. They can, you know, turn and weave and whatnot. But for the most part, this is what is gonna, the main support structure. The white part at the very top, that's the support tip. This is the part that's gonna make contact with the model. Generally, you're gonna go down for me, I use anywhere from like 0.12 millimeters all the way up to 0.4 millimeters for like my largest support tip. Then you've got the orange right here. The orange is the bracing. The bracing, of course, is just to make sure that these yellow things being very tall don't kind of flop around when they're being printed. It keeps them nice and stable. And then the blue is what we call parented, parenting supports. And they're parented to basically, you can see it's two going into one long support shaft, therefore a parented support. But anyway, that's the breakdown of all the different types of supports within Lychee Slicer. Well, actually, I lied. There's one other type, and that's a mini support. You see right here, the orange, it makes contact to both the top and the bottom. The orange makes contact with the support structure. That's what makes it a bracing. However, if I were to disconnect this top part right here and stretch it out and have it contact the model, it would become a mini support. So the difference between a mini support and a bracing support, where both the bracing and the mini only have a top and a bottom, the mini makes contact with the model on either top or bottom, it doesn't matter, and the bracing never makes contact with the model. But anyway, there, there's all the different types of supports you'll find within Lychee Slicer. The next pieces of terminology are specific only to Lychee Slicer. So if you're using Lychee Slicer all the time, pay attention to these ones. The first one being inline supports. If you heard that before and you don't know what it means, let me show you. So first thing, I just have this cylinder in here. It's a rectangle. I'm gonna go over to prepare and then under manual. Here, you're going to see where it says inline supports. So you can toggle that on or off. Of course, I want it on. I'm going to place one support right here. And you see right here, it says use shift key. I'm going to hold down shift on my keyboard. And then I'm going to click again at the top of that one. And you're going to see it puts a bunch of lines, uh, well, supports in a line, inline supports. Now, these support tips are one millimeter apart because that's what that interval is. If I set this to, let's say, four millimeters, let's put a second line just right here. Click and then hold down shift again. Hold While holding shift, click again. And there you go, now they're four millimeters apart. And there you go. The next one is projection supports, one of my favorite tools in Lychee Slicer. This tool is really, really good for doing it, basically engineering parts, hard surface modeling, or bases. Let me show you where that is and how to use it. If you click on prepare, under manual, at the very bottom again, it says start support projection. Click on that, you'll click on the object, and you'll see it's basically lit up. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the yellow part is where we're gonna project supports from down to the build plate. So see how it's light like yellow? That's actually like the projector bulb light. It's flashing down. And we're gonna click on preview supports and I'm not gonna, I've created a whole video on how to use this tool. This is just showing you where it is. You can go check that out again on the Lightsheet YouTube channel. Click on add 212 supports and there you go, it's done. The next one is snap to grid. If you're unaware, Lightsheet Slicer has two ways it can place supports, basically on the grid or off the grid. On the grid, they're just gonna go, they're just basically gonna find a path to ground to wherever that be, it doesn't matter. Grid, it's gonna parent everything, remember the parenting, and it's gonna put all the support shafts, the yellow ones, on a grid pattern. To see what that looks like, here I've got the base over here where the grid supports were projected with it off. And you see everything down here just kinda goes straight down, it just finds a path. It looks pretty clean, but it takes a lot of resin and we end up with things that look like this, like resin walls. It's kinda like a dam where the resin and air can't get through. But if I come over here under structure and I turn on snap to grid, now just know snap to grid is based upon an object. It's not based upon a build plate or a scene. It's on or off per object. So here I just turned it on. I can grab all these supports right here and I can right click and click recalculate. 
and now it's going to snap them to that grid. This grid is set to 5 millimeters. I can even turn that up or down. And you can see right here, that's going to either create the, that's the distance between each support pillar, that 4 or 5. And if I move it up or down, it's going to create basically a bigger or smaller grid, snapping everything to it. Have you ever brought in a 3D file in Lychee Slicer and it shows up red and tells you you need to repair it? Well, that's the next terminology for this video. The repair tool and what types of errors can you get within 3D models and how do you kind of identify and correct them? To show you an example, I've got this cube right here. I intentionally made it really horrible and really simple. You can see this cube has some problems and I see the repair tool right here. So click on repair and Lychee Slicer is actually going to be able to completely repair this file. It's going to repair all the holes and now this thing is no longer showing red. If I click on the drop down under the objects library, you'll see that this thing is ready to go. But this error, this file had a lot of errors in it. Let me show you the different errors I put into it and what they mean. For that, let me load up this 3D modeling tool and like give you a look at this box to kind of show you all the terrible things I did to it. So right here, you'll see that there's orange and yellow. That orange and yellow right here are what we call normals. Now for this program, the normals that are supposed to be on the inside are blue and the ones that are supposed to be on the outside or kind of that orangish color. Different programs may have different things, but normals is kind of a way for the 3 program to say, yeah, that surface is supposed to be interior versus exterior. So if they're flipped, that could be a bad thing. Um, and just to fix it for me, I could just reverse the normals, but also Lychee did that itself. The next thing we'll see is that there's a big hole in the side of this box, or it basically is leaky. It can't, can't hold water. So for me, I would have to basically close this box up. And I can do that just by bridging these two lines right here. And now my box is completely closed, but this box still has another error in it. The next one's a little harder to explain, and that's what we call non-manifold. But you may find this type of error all over. And unfortunately, this is one that Lychee Slicer really has a hard time fixing, or actually most applications have a hard time fixing. To kind of tell you what non-manifold is, it's, again, I kind of have to show you. If I click on this dots right here, as you might know, a cube has exactly six points in space, one for each corner. And the way that 3D files work is there's a polygon, um, or you know some, some sort of flat shape that attaches to these points, and that's how you get surfaces. So if I come over here and I grab this polygon right here, and I delete it, you'll see this now has a hole in it again. If I close this back up, it's going to attach to all four points, kind of like that. Um, I can do it slightly different. I can attach it only to two sides at once. And so you can kind of see that there's um, these two polygons right here, one on each side. But what if I were to put another polygon on top of these polygons that shares the same points? And I can do that. I can come over here and I can, you see how these are, they're two triangles, two individual polygons, but I can put another one right over it. So now what I have is I have one polygon that kind of goes over the two, it's overlapping it and sharing the same points. That's what we call non-manifold, where you've got too many polygons welded to too many points. It's no longer a very really complete object. There's, you know, a rift in space or something. It's like it's kind of difficult to explain, but if you want another kind of more visual explanation of what that looks like, there's some documentation that I wrote a bit ago that explains it in more detail. If you want to find out where that is, head over to the Mango 3D website. You're going to head over to Help Center and then Documentation. You're just going to scroll down and look for the resin documentation. From there, we're going to click on the layout. And then from there, we're going to click on Repair Tool. Now, there's actually a lot of good information here. So if you're trying to learn Lightyear Slice or anything like that one, I would highly recommend heading over here. But if you click on the Repair Tool, you're going to see I've got some more pictures and some more descriptions of the different type of errors you're going to find with the 3D file that you're trying to 3D print. All right, and you know the drill by now. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Lightyear YouTube channel so I continue making content like this for you. It really does help. Also, if you could, please join us on the Lightyear Slicer Discord. Well, reach out to me or any of our awesome moderators or the great community if you need help with resin 3D printing or FDM printing, or you just want to drop in and say hello. And as always, thank you for watching. Have a good day.